Hey, James Rath here. I tend to get a lot of emails and direct messages from parents who have recently learned that their child or newborn has some form of visual impairment or blindness. Oftentimes these inquiries are asking for advice or asking me personal questions about my own journey. And first off, let me just say, I'm not an ophthalmologist. Joking aside, I appreciate that the content is connecting and discovering folks who find it helpful. That's why I do enjoy creating these types of videos where I'm answering your questions, because you're probably not going to be the only one who has that question. Many folks will, new folks who just are now discovering the channel or will in the future. In this particular video, I'm actually answering questions from parents and students as well, because we need advice. I needed advice when I was younger. I didn't always get that advice. I didn't have someone a role model, I didn't have YouTube, <laughs> and people who were visually impaired and blind making videos about what it was like growing up visually impaired and blind. So that's what this is about. Before we get into the questions, I do just want to say something. There are going to be tough days. There's going to be rough days. There's going to be outside influence, your peers or other students who want to try and belittle you, who, who want to try to make you feel lesser than, because you're different, because your child is different. It happened to me. It happened to me multiple times. And it did create some really rough times in my life. And frankly, I think it was harder because I didn't have anyone to look up to. I didn't have other people who were older than me to tell me that things are fine, things are going to be cool. And something that I learned growing up is my legal blindness the way I see, it's helped me gain perspective. It's helped me accept others. It's helped me be a better person. And I think that's, that's more than I could have ever asked for. Frankly, the world is full of differences. The world is full of people with disabilities. One in seven people worldwide have some type of a disability. That's the world we live in. And if people in school, if people who you grow up with have a hard time adapting and accepting that and realizing that they're going to have a hard time in the real world. And even though we're continuously working towards a more accessible world and, and creating accessible spaces and accommodations and understanding that people with disabilities can do things, can work, can live fulfilling lives and, and share and educate that. I think the people who deny diversity, people who don't accept the differences in other people, are gonna have a worse time, especially as we're going into a more progressive landscape. Let's get into some questions. I'm gonna have my iPhone read these questions. Valerie asks, as a mom to a newly legally blind baby and a new follower, I would absolutely love to hear things you're most proud about that you've accomplished. Thank you, Valerie, for your questions. I know you have more. I'm going to tackle your first one real fast. I wanna talk about things that I accomplished both when I was younger and something that I'm proud of as an adult. Back in high school, I decided to take up some acting, and it wasn't necessarily because I wanted to be an actor, but it was because I loved directing, and I, I wanted to be a director, which I've gotten to do. But something I wanted to understand was, how does an actor see a director? What does an actor go through? Because by understanding my opposition, I can better understand how to support and accommodate that experience. I know every director's got their own style, every director uh, wants to either take a more aggressive or a more friendly approach, and there's no right or wrong answer. Every directing style works different for every director, but for me, I needed to understand what was like being on the other side. So I, I did some plays, I did some musicals, and in one of the final plays that I did in high school, we were doing The Importance of Being Earnest, I was earnest, which had probably the most lines in the play, if not tied for the most lines in the play, and that was tough for someone who couldn't read. My academic teachers, my director, my teacher for the visually impaired, no one fully understood the extent of my visual impairment, right? It's not just that I can't see well, it's that I can't focus my eyes. And even focus to their best extent, that can't happen for long. And lights also literally blind me. Too much light like this. I can only see the lights right now. So many people didn't understand the actual symptoms that my visual impairments had. So the expectation was that you read to memorize your lines. So every other sighted actor that I worked with managed to do it. So this put me at a disadvantage because the expectation was to read to memorize your lines. So now I had to sort of figure out a new method of memorization beyond 
just memorizing. We figured out that by having an assistant director feeding me my lines during rehearsals, so me hearing it was one way to go about learning it. Eventually to speed up the memorization process, what I ended up doing at home was finding the play online and literally just listening to that. Whether I was going for a walk, whether I was riding the bus, or I was taking a shower, I was always just listening to this play for weeks upon weeks until it got to the point where I could recite it word for word. And that is how by the time that we got to our dress rehearsals, I was able to get through the entire play. It really just came back to, I can't read. <laughs> this was a pretty tough period because I really just wanted to quit due to the pressure. I had some co-stars literally hammering me for not being able to read the same way that they could, for not being able to hit that expectation. And at the same time, I was pretty much tasked at trying to find the solution. I did have a lot of support though from my director and from my uh, showrunner, but again, it was just a pretty tough time thanks to the pressure from my peers. We figured it out. It was a great time. I, ha I love that play. So <laughs> appreciation for that. Fast forward to my adulthood. College was something that I was looking to go to. I was looking to potentially go to a film school. I was definitely go to a film school. And I had a couple options, but one of the ones I really wanted to attend actually denied me, but wanted me to get my marks up, get my grades up. I graduated with a 1.8 GPA, and that comes back to not being fully set up for success, which we'll get back to with some other questions that are definitely coming. But they wanted me to go to a community college to get my marks up and reapply, and, and they wanted me in their film program, but the academics, they didn't want me on their records with the current academic performance I had. Ultimately, I decided to take a gap year, which has since extended to multiple gap years to the point where I haven't gone to college. Don't really intend to either. Within the time that it would have taken me to graduate film school, I was already directing a half million dollar commercial campaign for a global brand, Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> Hi, my name is James Rath. I'm a legally blind filmmaker and director on the Tommy Adaptive shoot. Mom and Dad, let me let me ask real quick. What's it like taking care of Mia? And that campaign went on to win three notable awards at Can Lions, which is pretty much the premier advertising marketing conference in the world. If that's not one heck of a qualification for accessibility and marketing, I don't know what is. How did your parents best support you growing up? To be honest, my parents really did support me. They really supported anything that I was into and that I liked and wanted to pursue. Filmmaking, the arts, anything along those lines. Even poetry recitation at one point in time. My, my parents were quite supportive. Now, I don't believe that they always got the right answers all the right times to uh, support me, especially academically and when it comes to like accommodations. Now. I don't necessarily blame them for that. They also had another visually impaired son who came before me, and he, though visually impaired, he wasn't legally blind. And his accommodations are a little bit different from what I need. But of course, we had these exact same eye conditions, and so we're trying to understand the differences and, and how, how much more I may need in terms of like a white cane, or maybe even consider a guide dog early on, or a lot more orientation and mobility, or even learning something like braille so that I can actually read. None of that was really considered or really even, I don't think, offered to them. Now I could be completely wrong, I had my information wrong about what was offered to them and what they thought was like the right route to go, but of course they always consulted with an ophthalmologist about it. Also, did you attend mainstream schools or a school for the blind? To answer your last question, I went to a mainstream school and not a school for the blind. And I have thoughts on either or. However, because I went to a mainstream school, I really wasn't offered the things that maybe I should have been at least offered. Especially because my parents were investing in my education early on. We went to a private school. They paid a lot of money. My family paid a lot of money for the best education for me. And even then, as I talked about in my prior video with Chris Ulmer of Special Books by Special Kids, that school decided to kick me out, essentially uh, boot me from school early on in first grade because I couldn't keep up and because they didn't offer me accommodations that I probably should have had, such as learning braille. Had I been able to learn braille at the same time that kids were learning to read, who knows how much more advanced my, my academics could have been or on par with my peers. But because that school decided to really hold me back more than anything, 
as I was getting older, I definitely fell behind, especially when it came to going to a new school. Sama asks, when did you decide to hold a white cane? Is it better to enroll my son in a school for legally blind people? Thank you for your questions. I'll answer your first question first. The white cane, in terms of that, I actually didn't even hold my first white cane until I was 19 years old. And that was when I was living on my own and I'd moved about 3,000 miles away from my hometown. You know, I, I, I'd been navigating the city. I realized that I'm not with my parents anymore. I'm not side by side with someone all the time I'm going out. And I'm actually walking on sidewalks. I'm not just driving up to a, to a, a mall or, or a uh, storefront and literally walking side by side with either friends or, or family. No, I'm on my own. I'm walking, I'm navigating a city and I'm crossing streets on my own. And that's when I realized I'm doing this with one-tenth the sight most of the time. Otherwise, my vision's worse. One-tenth the sight of everyone else around me. So I picked up a weight cane because I wanted to try it. And gosh, the amount of freedom it gave me, the amount of more input and information I had about the surrounding terrain or the, the distance between me and the road and, and learning to adapt to my ears and listening, it was all very refreshing for me to, to finally feel some sort of independence. Because I didn't feel that. I just felt kind of lost when I was on my own independently without the proper accommodation. So white canes, big fan. I definitely recommend if your child is even visually impaired, offer the white cane early on. Offer orientation mobility as early as you can. Options are great. Now to answer your second question about going to a school for the blind, I did not. So I can't necessarily share that experience because I, I just didn't. I went to a mainstream school as I mentioned before. However, what I would recommend is a good balance. I notice a lot of people who go to a mainstream school tend to feel a little bit left out of the blind community. And then people who go to a school for the blind possibly feel a little bit left out in terms of like a mainstream social setting. I don't think you can go wrong either way with going to a school for the blind or a school that is considered mainstream. However, I think there needs to be a good balance in terms of interactions between people who are alike and, and people who, who are different. Something that my parents did enroll me in early on, and my brother as well, a camp for the blind and visually impaired. This was a six week day camp every summer, and I got to socialize every year, every summer, with other kids who were totally blind to just visually impaired. Some who had better vision than me, but were still there, and some that used white canes, some had guide dogs. So I got to be around all of that when I was younger, which is good. And then I went to another athletic camp for the blind where I learned how to play goalball, which is honestly my favorite sport. And I really want to play more once we are in a safer <laughs> uh, environment to do so. But then I also got to play a thing called beep baseball. Baseball, but with a ball that beeps so you can hear it coming. And each one of the bases has their own tone. It's just, it was mind blowing to know that there are sports out there that are accessible to my other senses. So certainly find a balance between socializing within the community of those who are blind and low vision, because you learn a lot. You learn about new options, new technology, new assistive tech that's out there. And then also just putting yourself in mainstream social settings because that's how the majority of the world is. Questions from Jen. Hi, also a new follower and mom of a visual impaired son, four years old. I'd love to know what you liked or disliked growing up about what your parents did, how they raised you. Hey Jen, welcome aboard. Thank you for your question. Something that my parents, I really liked that they did was ensuring I had an IEP, ensuring that there were accommodations, even if, again, later down the line, I didn't think all of them were the right ones. And I wish that was caught early on and I, I don't fully fault them, but that is one thing I like is, is at least there were some accommodations and my visual impairment was not ignored. I could identify with having a visual impairment because then it recognized that I need to do things differently. Then in terms of something that I, I disliked, probably just, just not learning braille early on. Uh, that would have been, I think, pretty life-changing in, in many ways. That's, that's pretty much it. My parents are great. Love them. What kind of gadgets and technical helpers do you use in your everyday life? So what kind of gadgets or assistive technology I used was things like CCTVs. And these things were actually really cool. Probably some of my favorite visually impaired tech growing up. 
they were expensive and I don't have mine anymore. If any companies that make them uh, want to reach out, I'd love to check some out, especially some more modern ones. But uh, the ones that I had, I donated to um, other students who have visual impairments. For CCTVs, those things are great. I could put my Game Boy underneath and actually like zoom in and see and, and turn the screen into like more of an accessible display that was right up to my face. I also had dome magnifiers. Those were all right here and there, but you know, quite limited. Again, I can't really read, but it was helpful to like identify things in, in pictures and illustrations. Uh, and then when I was about 14, I got my first Mac. And that was really cool because then I was able to actually accessibly use a computer natively too. And I did have ZoomText, which is a software on Windows that does a lot of similar things like zooming and text to speech, but it's a program. It runs separately from the actual system, whereas on the Mac, it's built in natively and it works really well. It's honestly like the Zoom is my favorite implementation of a system level Zoom that I've ever ever used. Sorry, I have millions of questions in my head, grinning face with smiling eyes and sweat drop, monkey covering mouth. I absolutely love that you are in film, arts and apparently happy in life. That gives me as a mum hope my boy can follow his dreams too, whatever they will be. Sending lots of love from Austria. Looking forward to your video. Well, love to Australia back from the United States, so thank you again for your questions. I appreciate it. Isaac says, I'm not a parent, but I am a blind student, and am curious at what age do you start advocating for your needs instead of having your parents or teachers do it for you? Isaac, thank you for your question. This is a really important one. I wanted to end off on this because when did I start to advocate for myself? I, I can think of really two times. One was when I was in high school, and the public school I was going to refused to let me use my Mac on the school network. It literally took about seven months to actually get a Mac in the classroom, and that one was like administrated by the school and the state, and anytime I wanted to adjust any accessibility settings, because keep in mind, accessibility settings, the more options you have, the better, and you can experiment and you can play with, but I had to wait until Tuesday afternoon when my uh, teacher of the visually impaired actually came in, had the admin password and could like make any sort of adjustments. But it was hard for me to like experiment and really get to know what I need, especially for uh, program to program. I just, I, I didn't like that. It was a lot of fighting, it was a lot of energy. And I spent literally my first year of high school just trying to advocate for myself. At the same time, this is the same year I was adjusting to being legally blind again after about two years of not being legally blind from an experimental surgery. So I was getting back to adjusting to less vision, to, to uh, sometimes having to literally go total blindness during certain parts of the day. So that was a, a pretty tough year to really have to like adjust again to being legally blind and to really relying on other senses, but then having to spend so much energy just to advocate and, and tell my my adults in my life and influence them that like, look, I need something different. I need something better. I need more. Ultimately, that year led me to go to another school because it just wasn't going to work out for me at this school. I, I just knew, uh, I, I didn't know what the next following years were going to bring. And this other school, though they offered less in terms of like getting accommodations in the door, they were pretty good with like meeting needs and they allowed me to have an iPhone and a MacBook in the classroom my own as well, that was already set to my settings and everything I needed it to do. And they allowed me to just use an app to scan my papers, email it to my school email, open it up in Google Docs. Of course, it's a little easier nowadays to do all this, but then from Google Docs, you could select all the texts because it was able to recognize text from an image, and then I could have my computer read it. Great for reading passages and stuff, but again, there's easier technology out there now than doing all that. And even for the time, that was a cool thing to kind of work out and figure out for myself. And then in terms of advocating for myself as an adult, as I mentioned before, getting that white cane, looking into the decision of whether a guide dog would be right for me or not, taking things like learning public transit and being able to advocate for myself in the workplace. That was a really a, another revelation of my advocacy for myself. I went from doing it really this one major time, this one point in my life to then like, I'm an adult. There are things I need, things that I need people to know who are going to be within my circle, in my bubble, uh, and and otherwise, they ain't gonna work. 
it's, it's not gonna be compatible, whether it was work or friendships or whatever it might be. So those were questions that I got from parents and a student just basically all about what it was like to grow up legally blind. And I hope that gives a little bit of insight. Keep in mind, I am no medical professional, so I can't really give you that advice. So take everything that I say, knowing that that's lived experience and that's just my own take and, and impressions of things. Options are cool. Advocate for yourself. Always try to know what options are available and try anything and everything. Let me know in the comments down below. Was there a time that you can recall that you had to advocate for yourself? Could be the small things, it could have been something that was really big and took months upon months or even years to really do and, and get. And maybe it didn't work. Tell me about it. I want to hear from you. I hope that you could see something different today. And I will hear you next time. Bye.